submitted, uh, we'll talk about how we're going to apply some of the technologies. We'll discuss very briefly other technologies besides beams, but only in a, a passing manner, just so you can keep in mind that they also may be relevant. And then we'll uh, go into depth on several of our case studies on uh, historical and uh, modern building renovation. So we have a lot of technology to talk about, and it's going to be quite interesting. So first, let's hit a little bit about the market today. You know, when you talk about any reason to touch a building, you've got to ask yourself, why am I doing this? And to me, the most common denominator is that you need to change the space's function. And if you change the space's function, you may have increased the loading. Now, one of the buildings that comes to mind that uh, uh, was a retrofit to me was uh, when you went to, uh, say, the Pentagon. The Pentagon was modified because it was built for typewriters. And then in today's modern world, we had a larger sensible load inside that space. And one of the ways that the renovation was done was using hydronics to do the additional sensible cooling. And when you look at beams, the water beams, beams are this very efficient unit taking room air and passing the air across the sensible cooling coil. So, you know, there's, there's opportunities here. Now, you know, oftentimes when we start touching this space, the codes have changed, and, and as you know, the codes are always being updated, and they're one of the things that's almost always updated is that it has to be more energy efficient. So when you start getting some of these energy savings, um, you're going to start finding yourself considering hybrid systems in a way. Um, when I say hybrid, I mean primarily not just an all-air system where you may be end up using water as one of your medias for transferring energy, um, simply because of the brake horsepower reduction and the overall transfer of energy from one space to another, water being more energy dense is just simply less expensive to pump than all air. Now, one of my personal preferences is that if I'm going to renovate a space, I'm going to also improve the thermal comfort. Now, actually, you know, it's interesting. The thermal comfort aspect is related to the space use in many ways in my mind. Um, BOMA, Building Management Association, a few years ago, released a study that says one of the primary reasons that uh, occupants change uh, spaces, uh, tenants from one space to another, is thermal comfort being one of the drivers that causes their interest in other spaces to come up. So if I can improve the thermal comfort, I benefit. Now, thermal comfort can also involve the cleanliness of the air, the amount of background sound. It's all about how the occupant perceives the space. And beings fit in very, very well in this because we're transferring less air, so we have less background sound. Um, there's less draft likely that's the air systems often have a higher percentage of outside air in them. So we have that perception of cleanliness that comes from the type of air we're distributing. So again, beams are really a, a favorite of mine when we start talking about renovation. You know, and the ultimate goal, of course, is either if you own the building to attract or retain your tenants. And at the same time you're doing that, you'd really prefer to only invest ever so many years, not every other year. And what we see with the beam systems is a very long lifespan, 20 plus years. It, it will actually touch on that indirectly when we talk about some of the technologies that have been installed since the 70s, which are hydronic based, and they lasted some 30 years. So there is potential there. Now, if I were to look at that whole list I gave you of reasons why to retrofit, the number one problem from a designing point of view to me has to be how much energy am I going to save. Now this graphic shows over a period of time from 85 and it's projected out to around uh, 2015, there's a trend showing that energy demand is increasing and the scale on the left is millions of kilowatt hours. So we're talking some serious energy use in the United States for uh, uh, our buildings and the price has also been increasing almost linear as well. So if I can drop my energy consumption in a building, then I can do it in a significant manner. You know, I, we had one building that came in uh, with up to around 67% brake horsepower energy consumption reduction. Um, and and this, this energy analysis came in from the energy company providing feedback to the owner of the building. The designer had estimated through the uh, design tools with LEED and uh, 90.1 that they would see about 52% savings. So, you know, there's opportunities here that are significant. I wish I could get that in every climate, but it is a potential and will save energy. Now, the question is how much, and that's a, a system question more than a component, and 
At this point, I'm going to talk more about components in an effort to help us get to the decision to take this particular approach in the design. Now, of course, sustainability is a goal. And if you look at sustainability aspects of these technologies, one is how much uh, energy do I have to provide to cool it? And, you know, ground source heat pump, great technologies for these type systems, low energy intensive heat transfer systems. And sometimes they're associated with tax credits, which, of course, is a bonus if you're trying to do the uh, rate of return on your investment. And at the same time, it would be really nice if I could save energy and improve the environment at the same time. So what are the opportunities? You know, I've always been amazed uh, by the number of buildings that are renovated on a continual basis in the United States. It's been estimated that in 2030, 75 to 80 percent of the buildings that we'll be occupying in urban areas already currently exist. And the majority of them are old enough that they're undergoing renovation now, or definitely by 2030 most likely will hit that limit and need some sort of refreshment, even if it's only to, to uh, improve the energy efficiency. And there's this vast installed uh, amount of office building spaces, schools, hospitals, high energy consumption, hospitals have to be on that list. Um, and then there's the uh, common spaces like churches and libraries, um, convention centers and such. They're all going to be looking at ways of improving the efficiency and there's this vast installed aspects. Now, if you want to look at a trend, it's interesting. Green construction comes to the front um, because back Oh, 10 years ago, we, we really weren't so concerned about being energy efficient green, per se. But since 2008, um, we've gone from about 15% of construction to, uh, in 2012, 45%. And, you know, this is in general uh, from Dodge's uh, analysis of the market. But I, I also know that from the healthcare point of view, um, in the same time frame, we've gone from about 15% of hospitals to the same amount of savings to, or, green construction to now over half in 2013 being designed with the green approach. And it's all related to energy intensity and how you can still condition the space, meet the requirements for higher air volumes, and save energy. So how do we do this renovations? Well, there's several ways that you can approach it. Depending upon what your infrastructure is in the building and to what level of renovation you wish to go. I mean, and you're going to keep the mechanical infrastructure to whatever extent you can, or you're going to gut the building, put a brand new facade on. These are questions that will help you decide which of these technologies I'll approach. Now today, of course, I'm primarily, and Chris will primarily talk on water-based systems, active and passive beams, rating panels, and sails. Now other technologies that we've used quite successfully in renovations to save energy include underfloor air distribution, um, and actually, interestingly enough, it can be a combination with the radiant products. That's a great synergy that goes with it. Uh, displacement ventilation, another great synergy product to go with beams or a standalone technology. And then you get into, well, if I have a building that's fan-powered, overhead mixing, do I want to put in a fan coil instead? And the answer is yes, you perhaps do. But interestingly enough, we see a lot of the chill beam systems going in with high-efficiency fan coils to help provide that increased air volume they need of outside air in space. Or perhaps we're incorporating energy recovery units. All great conversations to have. But again today, I'm going to focus on beams. Now when you look at a space and you're renovating it, you usually have fixed floor to floor heights. Now whether the facade stays or not, that's a decision made by the designers, architect and such. The one goal that I've noticed is no matter what I see, there's never enough plenum space. Never. Because what do we want to do? When we renovate a building, we want to make it appear more open. So oftentimes, we'll have a higher ceiling. And if you can increase the ceiling height off the finished floor by a foot, the building appears to be just so much more open and inviting. And you know, if you're increasing the height of occupancy, that means the equipment you put in has to be smaller than what we used before. But now we're at a double-edged sword because we may be increasing the energy efficiency, we may have to change the air volumes based on codes, so it's, it, they fight each other in a way. And the other thing is that, you know, depending on what the infrastructure is, I might be able to minimize the amount of, of work I have to do to the building by reutilizing the ductwork if I'm doing a chill 
main system, or if it had hydronic water piping already through the building, we might be able to do that to cut the cost. Um, one, one concern I have always, though, is uh, can I minimize the amount of impact I have on the footprint of the floor? You know, on these older buildings, we have uh, uh, oftentimes the uh, air conditioning equipment would be on the roof or in, the, in a basement or in a, perhaps a mid-level floor. And we have all these shafts that penetrate from floor to floor. And the all air systems have a massive amount of space devoted to ductwork. You know, it's non-rentable space. We have seen several instances of when you go in and actually replace the ductwork and use a beam system, because of the reduction in air volume that we have, we've increased the rentable floor space appreciably. There was a hospital design not too long ago that they looked at a footprint for an overhead system, traditional mixing, versus a chill beam system. And they found they had room for an additional space for a patient room when they went to the beam system because of this reduction in risers. It can be that radical. Now, the, the problem, of course, comes from if you're doing a historical renovation in particular, infiltration is something you have to worry about. Older buildings oftentimes would leak 20, 25 air changes through them um, simply because of the way the building was constructed. We never really had a, a tight control, particularly earlier than the 60s, of how air moved through the space so much. And when the energy codes changed, we started tightening our constructions up. And I've been told that today's construction is uh, commonly seen anywhere between four to six air changes of, of natural infiltration through the building. So we've tightened that up a lot. But if I'm going to go in and put in, a, in an older building a chilled water system, I have to concern myself about the risk of condensate. So in areas of high latent loads or in areas of high outside humidity levels, one area that we would touch upon in a review is how do you handle the latent load. Okay? And our usual goal is to do it with the air system while still shifting the bulk of the sensible load to the latent system, water system. My whole goal, if I can, is to minimize the amount of change I have to do in the building from an infrastructure point of view. And this gives you more maximum use of the current existing structure. The one thing that definitely most likely should be on the list, if it's not already, is how do I do the controls the older buildings were often pneumatically based, and a uh, great system, a lot of power, but uh, over time, we've come to more accurate control systems with the ability to do different sequencing, deal with the occupancies. So a huge benefit to us in controlling the systems is how I do that control, and I encourage you to consider the, the uh, digital systems to replace all the uh, pneumatics as a, a necessary item on your list. We'll touch briefly on this again. So how do you know if beams are an ideal solution for your particular renovation? If you have a higher sensible load, but you're not going to change the air system, water systems are going to be of a deal, a, a level of interest that you're going to consider them because of the ability to handle these higher loads without changing the ductwork. If you're going to reduce your plenum space available, then low systems of height are interest. Beam systems can be very low height compared to terminal units and other systems that could be up to 20 inches in height. Um, if I'm changing my duct statics because I want to reduce my brake horsepower, well then beams again are coming to the forefront because they take less driving force to move the same amount of room air through than what the older legacy systems did. If I want to increase the chilled water temperature coming from my central system, say I'm using ground source heat pump now or an evaporative tower, something to do energy cooling or the water cooling without going down to uh, really low temperatures, beam systems are a natural fit. And also they often experience low pressure or drop for water. You know, I, I had an interesting challenge a, a year ago where there's an existing structure that is being renovated to the point that they're leaving the basic structure but they're taking the facade off, they're leaving the air handlers and the ductwork, but basically it's gutted past that point. And they're putting in this ultra clear glass facade, and naturally it's a south facing building. And they had uh, several other rooms that showed a 7,000 BTU loading in Sensible. And uh, we were given the challenge of providing 40 CFM of air to this room and taking 7,000 BTUs of load out of it. And uh, through Chris's work, we were able to come up with a solution using active and passive beams in conjunction to handle that load with only 40 CFM of primary driving air. 
it's a great, great opportunity in the future. I'm certain we'll be talking about that building once its renovation is complete at some point. Unfortunately, not today. So the opportunities that we have. When we look at it, one of the things you have to understand is that there's not just one type of product out there that can fit inside your building. We have different configurations, different locations, um, different amounts of uh, uh, discharge velocity, and so forth. The, the most common ones are the linear products, where we have um, either a one foot or a two foot wide beam, uh, anywhere from two foot to ten foot in length as a discrete unit, where we have one way or a two way discharge. And in this system, we can see around a thousand BTUs per lineal foot in cooling capacity um, quite easily with this system. So when you look at it from an energy point of view, you know, active beams, just because they are very energy dense in terms of cooling capability for lean of foot, they're, they're a great, great fit. Now from an aesthetics point of view, there's several options you can do here too. One is the perforated face, which is shown on the screen. It's easily the most common one available, but we can also do things to help the aesthetics, such as bar linear faces or colors or, or other options for that. But again, this is probably the most common configuration of beam worldwide. Now, when we start talking about this particular configuration, there are several things you might want to consider as options. Um, one thing I've been told is that continuity of ceiling plane is important. If I can have a, uh, an item in the ceiling that's uh, appearing to be a continual length or something that's not uh, going to disrupt the eye path travel across the ceiling, it's a good thing. One thing I can do is put a return in line with the beam so that it appears to just be the same device. So the return is hidden in plain sight. Um, you know, as a aside, that's a phenomenal performance gain too because oftentimes in overhead systems we have supplier diffusers flowing air directly across the return. That's called short circuiting and, and the ultimate goal um, an energy and efficiency. So by putting the return as part of the beam, integrated, we never have air from the supply flowing directly into the return and minimizes the potential for short circuiting. Now, uh, what also is shown on this screen uh, next to this return here is a control enclosure opening. If you're doing a retrofit and you're minimizing your ceiling height, you might be concerned about access to the controls. Um, this allows you to find uh, the control simply by opening the face. So something that's oftentimes considered as an option. Now, I had assumed at this point that we were talking about a ceiling system along with the beams. Now, what if you don't want a ceiling? You've maximized your, your uh, occupancy from floor to floor by taking out any ceiling. Well, what are you going to do? You can have exposed products. Now, if I have an exposed product, I, I, as you're probably very well aware on overhead systems, if I just put a ceiling diffuser in without the, the uh, associated ceiling tiles, the air will come down toward the occupancy because we rely on this surface of the ceiling to do uh, what's called Kawanda effect, if you will. It attaches the air to the ceiling and helps direct it out of the discharge. So if you're going to do an exposed mount on a beam, you have a choice, and I would encourage you to consider putting in what are called Kawanda wings. Now, they're not very wide. What they do is allow the air to attach and finish its transition from the inside of the beam to the room side, and this helps minimize the potential for air coming down into the occupancy and still having enough velocity to cause a draft complaint uh, from the occupants. Now there's an aside, of course, that if I have a Kawanda wing, you know, I have a beam, I'm supplying water piping to it, I'm supplying air ducts to it, the Kawanda wings can actually be configured in a way to help hide those surfaces. So what you have is more of a continual unit through the room with, with uh, less aesthetic issues. We can even go so far as to bolt the uh, beams together lengthwise so we have one common plenum supplying primary air to the system rather than multiple pieces of duct work going through the room. One of my favorite beams actually is a soffit beam. Now, when we start talking about uh, atriums and areas of, of uh, large space, when we're doing overhead systems, we always worry about how do I get the air to the exterior wall to wash the windows? Um, how do I do it in a way that's aesthetically pleasing? 
um, we often end up using linear diffusers as a discharge. And esophagene, as shown here, um, you can see this large opening. This opening is designed to attach whatever type of discharge diffuser you're looking for, be it a linear, a, a bar face, or so forth. And at the same time, we have very low profile and height, so I can fit this in a socket that's very narrow in penetration toward the occupancy, or perhaps even under a window washing upward. Now, it doesn't have the same level of capacity as the linears do, but it's still significant. It's 700 BTUs per lineal foot cooling capacity. And if you look at how they're installed, wow. You know, this is uh, this is one of my favorite uh, installations because at the exterior facade where we have all the solar gain, we're washing those windows with linears. We're now doing it with a high efficiency linear where we have the uh, bar face here, that's the return air from the rim going up through the unit and being discharged out the slot condition to meet the requirements to handle exterior load. So we're talking about an atrium. This is one of the first ones I might recommend. Um, this is actually going in several buildings across the United States, and uh, I think it's going to be a great addition to their um, overall aesthetic. Now, uh, up to this point, I've talked about a chill beam as a supply with a mixing diffuser characteristic. So we're taking the room and we're mixing the entire space, or in the case of the atrium, at least washing windows with it. It is possible as I mentioned earlier, to take the chill beam and combine it with a different technology like displacement, which is uh, all uh, air movement is basically driven in the occupied space by the heat loads. They are a thermal pump. They take the air from the floor upward. And this saves energy through stratification because I'm not recirculating any of that heat gain from the heat load, and therefore I don't have to cool that in the room. What I end up doing is taking a return air temperature that's much more elevated back to my central system, I still have the heat transfer curve, but it's an extremely efficient system compared to an overhead mixing. And it's been used many times in schools, conference rooms, meeting spaces, and such to great effect. Now, this in my mind is a sort of a hybrid where we're taking a displacement technology and combining it with a, uh, a chill beam. Now, we've uh, seen a lot of uh, different requirements for this aesthetically. We even have seen where you want a bookcase built in the end of the unit so that we have more of a furniture piece going along the exterior glazing, um, say in a school or some other space where they would normally experience having had a unit ventilator in history pass. We put this in instead. And the dynamics of it, well, you have this gain from your exterior shell, radiant and uh, thermal conduction, and you have your uh, heat transfer in and out of this beam from the water plus your primary air for ventilation. And what you get is discharge air from the bottom going out to the heat loads where they naturally move upward through stratification, taking their heat generation and rejecting it to the return. You have some, in this case, of the air in the space being drawn back through the coil and uh, back along the floor to give you some of your uh, uh, air movement through the beam. Um, so it, it's a very efficient system. It's very quiet and uh, tends to have a high level of occupancy satisfaction. Now, without looking at the displacement unit, um, if you go back to the overhead systems for linears, they have typically long throws. And we've, we've used them that way for specific reasons. Uh, we, like I said, we wash atriums with them. But what if I have a smaller footprint of space, say it's an office room or a patient room, and I, I don't have the ability to have really long throws. When, when we look at overhead diffusers, we oftentimes would put a four-way diffuser in, a four-way discharge. And by throwing it in four directions, we actually short the overall throw if I had just been throwing it out of one or two of the sides because the dynamics of how the room operates. So a modular beam is oftentimes pulled to the front when we're talking about these footprints. And they're standard available in a two-by-two or a two-by-four footprint. Um, we can do a four-way discharge is typical, but you can get two and three ways if you need um, two or four pipe. And the capacity actually is very decent. It's around 1,100 BTUs per lineal foot. So you know, if you have a really intensive uh, heat transfer requirement, this may be an excellent solution for that alone. So let's talk about some retrofit. One of the most common uses of induction terminals um, 
was for exterior gain loads. And it was very popular in the 60s and 70s, used extensively in universities, uh, many, many hospitals across the United States, some offices. Um, they uh, were typically a higher static pressure unit. It's interesting when you look at how our, our product on the market has evolved over the last 30 to 40 years. Um, there have been significant efficiency gains in how we do the induction through the unit. For instance, we no longer require what I would consider high static pressure to get the same energy transfer. Now, it's an unfortunate fact that, that high static pressures are almost always associated with high levels of noise generation. So if I can lower my static, I reduce my brake horsepower for my fan, but I also reduce my sound generation in the room. Now, some of these were actually designed to have condensing coils, and that is still a possibility we can do with the beam or with the fan coil, for that matter. So when you come to the point you have this type of building with this type of product in it that you want to renovate and bring to the future, or today's world, um, you have two choices to make, and the most commonly ones are fan-powered, but surprisingly enough, chill beams are actually probably more popular because of the energy savings associated with it. So if I'm going to retrofit it, I'm going to gain improved efficiency, improved comfort, reduction of noise, and because back in the 60s and 70s it was all pneumatic controls, I get to actually tie it to a building management system, and I get to have the benefits from occupancy control and actual zone-by-zone -zone measurement. And, you know, when you look at how the systems are built today, they're actually very easily maintained. They're designed for access from the maintenance point of view, not that there is a lot of maintenance required on these type products to be, to be up front. Now, if you, you look at a capacity side, we have what we call legacy induction units. And there were several brands available. But a typical performance map is shown in gray, and it went anywhere from around half an inch of static all the way up to four inches of static. That's a lot of rate horsepower we have inside the system. And there were capacities that were very decent. We had anywhere between 2,000 to 6,000 BTUs per hour, as shown in this graphic now. The green area, and this is one of our uh, replacement induction units, uh, replacement chill beams for the induction units, I'm sorry. And it typically runs around 0.2 inches of static to around an inch. And we're still seeing the same thermal characteristic with the same air volume going through the unit that we had before in the old legacy unit. The only difference is the nozzles are significantly more efficient at inducing room air through the coil compared to the old system, so they don't have to have the same driving velocity leaving the nozzle that we did on the older units, and hence the sound generation from that. One thing that you're going to replace it, I have any users, uh, owners of buildings go, hey, well, match the current product. You know, I don't want to change the way it looks. I like the way it looks. Let's just make it better. Well. That's interesting because we can do that. We can either build a brand new casing to match the current product's basic appearance, or we can replace the core of the unit and uh, get the uh, energy efficiency without changing the casing. Uh, my personal preference is to replace the casing. It's less issue for the contractor. In fact, you know, I've seen it where they remove the old systems and simply carry in a new one, bolt it into place, connect the connections, and they're done. And they can come with drain pads. If you are going to put a drain pan on any product, uh, particularly an item like this, which is, you know, may or may not see the maintenance on a regular basis, I really strongly recommend you use stainless steel pans or a polymer pan. Um, and, and this is an option that we have for these products. Uh, the other thing that we give you, if you're going to do condensing in particular on these units, you need a lens screen to keep the coil from having a buildup of, of, uh, of, uh, of particles on the surface water connecting the glue. Now, the reason I'm not recommending a filter is if you start putting a filter in front of an induction unit, you're actually increasing the static pressure drop across the coil and reducing its efficiency. Okay? Now, on the controls. Told you I'd touch on controls. Um, I love digital controls today. We could do so many things with them we couldn't do with the pneumatics. Well, at least not without many, many components that typically didn't work as we expected. Today's retrofits, um, one of the more popular items is a wireless thermostat. So I don't have to open the wall up. I just attach a stat. And if I'm within 50 feet of the, of the, uh, the controller on the unit, I have uh, significantly reduced my installation time. Uh, our controls are native BACnet. 
uh, they allow you to modulate the valves. We can do heat and cool changeover. Uh, we can add a water temperature sensor and, of course, a room temperature sensor. There's all these options that come with this that actually we could probably spend 45 minutes on, but uh, I think Chris wants to talk a little bit about some case studies and uh, appropriate since that's where we're at next in the presentation. So I'm going to turn it over to Chris now, and I thank you for your time, and I'm sure we'll have a few minutes for some question and answers at the end. Thanks, Jerry. Hi, everyone. I'm going to cover uh, three different types of case studies um, that have uh, retrofit applications. Uh, the first two are hydronic based, and then the last one is hydronic based as well, but also a varying, also had a varying amounts of different types of other products on it as well. Uh, so the very first case study we have here is a hospital retrofit. Uh, hospital retrofits were coming across uh, very often. Uh, for these types of applications where the, the building is running its lifespan and the equipment inside needs to be updated. Uh, for this particular uh, job here, uh, the engineer and the owner uh, were looking to improve comfort of the space uh, and also change the use of the space. The, the, essentially, this project was also going to be a phased project. So whatever happened in the first phase would be carried on over to the next following phases after. Uh, one of the criteria that the owner was looking to get out of the retrofit too was to reduce the energy consumption and operating costs associated with uh, the current current uh, system. Uh, some of the challenges that the uh, engineer faced uh, included just not being able to do any work to the existing structure and also the low interstitial space between the ceiling there. Uh, it's a very limited plenum space. In the first phase, uh, we looked at the uh, pharmacy in the basement. Uh, the baseline system here was the uh, all-air system of the AV system, and uh, we had uh, different loads that came out of this being upgraded from the, the codes required um, in the space. So uh, when the engineer looked at this space and looked at the, the beam products, he found that the, the beams fit very well in the uh, restrictions that were, that were placed on this job, uh, and it pretty much built up the rest of the, the, rest of the uh, phases that would follow with it. Uh, it proved to work very well for the system in being able to handle the, the increased loads. For the second phase, uh, they were looking at particularly patient rooms uh, and uh, looking at two wings in particular, a standard patient room um, configuration as well as a wing that, that was uh, built for a psychiatric ward. Uh, these spaces, uh, baseline retrofit was uh, the fan coil units along the perimeter with heating and cooling. Uh, because these, these were adjacent to the first phase, uh, they carried on the chilled beam design throughout because uh, it fit in the, the space required. Um, and uh, it would also allow them to upgrade the, the system in general to fit the ASHRAE 170 component uh, of the Denim H, which now allows uh, beams to be utilized in these beam spaces and allowing the induction uh, air that is brought in through the beam to count towards the air changes required for the space there. Uh, one challenge that we, we ran into with the security area or the security wing was pro providing a, a beam that was, you know, met the thermal comforts of the space uh, and took care of the loads, but also prevented the patients from being able to access the internals of the beam or, or get at the ductwork behind the the ceiling. So uh, we worked with the engineer in providing a, a uh, security type of face that uh, had tamper-proof uh, screws on it so that wouldn't allow people to, to get within the beam itself. So for this particular project, when they combined active beams with a dedicated outside air system, uh, they were able to reduce the primary air, uh, depending on which space it was put in, or the application it was used in from 30 to 60 percent. Uh, so this, in, in turn, uh, met the goals of the, in, of the owner in improving the energy efficiency of, of the space and decreasing the operating costs associated with them. Uh, with a typical beam system, uh, when you're looking at the, the latent loads, you're typically sizing the air side uh, to take care of the latent loads within the space and, and then running your water uh, above dew point. Uh, as an added uh, security or, or peace of mind for the owner, 
the, the engineer had included constant sensors on each of the beam as a, a monitoring, monitor, monitoring strategy uh, that helped alleviate any concerns that the facilities would have in um, maintaining these types of units in the space as well. The next case study is a uh, office building in uh, Massachusetts. <clears throat> uh, this challenge here for the engineer uh, involved a multi-floor building uh, with different tenants uh, on each floor and then of course on each floor various types of applications depending on the tenant that was uh, in the building itself. Um, one of the challenges with this building which the engineer faced was the limited air capacity um, available for the, for the building. Uh, the owner wanted to utilize the existing ductwork and the air handling unit that was uh, on, this, on this job. So the engineer took a look at this job and, and went through an iterative process of, of reviewing uh, depending on what floor or what the tenant was in the space on what they could do, uh, what products to use. Um, so Louis we looked at this with the engineer looked at the ventilation portion of it. Uh, the ventilation was sized so it fit uh, the minimum ventilation required for the space. And then in turn we optimized the beam performance for low flow. Uh, so we, we selected beams that were very efficient. And then for areas where, where, where the increase was more sensible load uh, than, than anything else, didn't need more air, didn't need more latent, uh, we included other sensible only products such as passive beams or radiant panels or chilled sails. Uh, as another strategy uh, for energy savings in the conference rooms. Uh, it was done with a control strategy using dedicated or uh, using a demand control ventilation and a VAV inlet on the beams. So depending on whether the rooms were occupied or unoccupied, uh, you were able to turn down or turn up the air side uh, to accommodate uh, the space or the requirement of the space. Uh, in this image here, you can see uh, the beams installed in a big long line here, in case you're wondering where the beams are located in the space. And uh, of course, it, it moves throughout the space deeper in as well. The beams themselves had uh, several options that were utilized uh, on this job. Uh, this particular beam that we see here is actually three uh, eight-foot sections, I believe, uh, that were connected together. Uh, with the slim line option that, that uh, Jerry talked about earlier. Uh, this slim line option provides a aesthetic appeal to the space and makes the beam look like one continuous beam. Uh, gives it a nice look. Uh, on top of that, uh, these beams also had a, a common plenum. So each beam was connected together with uh, a field installed uh, transition that would connect one plenum to the next uh, and also saved um, dollars for the contractor in, in doing any rework to the ductwork as well. So he could rerun the, or he wouldn't have to run any extra ductwork just to the one end of the beam connection itself. So all the beams would be connected and there would just be one inlet. Uh, so instead of branching out, uh, just one inlet would be available to reduce any um, installation required there. Um, a lot of the retrofit jobs that you come across uh, they tend to be very old buildings, so um, lots of people are trying to always maximize the space that's available. So a lot of the options that the engineer or the architect will look at is completely taking out the ceiling. So a lot of these beams you'll see uh, in these case studies uh, or, or other applications, you'll find that a lot of them are actually installed in an exposed application. So like Jerry mentioned earlier, uh, one of the options that we would provide with that would be a wings, and that is just to drag out the air further uh, so it doesn't drop right into the space itself. Uh, in this job, because we had uh, sensible only products too, they were coupled uh, between either active beams or they may have been a standalone product. Uh, they were installed with a, an active beam face, and what the active beam face was is uh, it gives the look of the active beam, but it was actually a passive beam. Uh, this gives a continuous look throughout the space and, and could be used as an aesthetic appeal, especially if we're going to run it in a slimline option like we see shown in this picture. One of the great talking points about this particular job is the uh, transfer effectiveness of, of the system itself. Because we were able to minimize the amount of air that was supplied, uh, utilize the um, 
ductwork and the air handling unit that existed uh, and push all the rest of the sensible loads onto the water side, we were able to get, get a combined performance of utilizing active beams, pass beams, shield sails, and, and radiant panels. Uh, we can get a transfer effectiveness of 149 BTUs per CFM. Uh, a typical beam system has a transfer effectiveness of, of between 70 to 90, so this is, this is great to see that the system is very energy efficient. Uh, another great point was we were able to utilize uh, what the owner wanted uh, using the existing air handling unit and the ductwork that already existed as well. And as the uh, tenants filled out the building, uh, the, inter the engineer was able to utilize different products of uh, hydronics to, to fit the application and spaces that, that were in this um, that were in this building. Uh, so this this varied from office buildings to conference rooms, uh, tele telephone booths, uh, open office plans, private offices, um, uh, things like that. Our final case study here is the uh, Fraunhofer Institute, also located in uh, Massachusetts. Uh, this building is uh, very interesting. It is a uh, living laboratory uh, for building technologies. Uh, so Fraunhofer is utilizing it to do a lot of sustainable research as well as uh, building system research as well. Uh, the challenge on this building is it's, it is a heritage building, uh, which also has an increased number of extra restrictions that are put upon, placed upon it, uh, usually, usually involving the facade and how the equipment within the uh, HVA system can be located in respect to, to the facade or, or where it can be viewable from the, from the street level. Uh, because it's also a heritage building, um, it's about 100 years old, uh, the building envelope is something that, we, we, that the engineer would need to review um, for infiltration, making sure we have a good control of the space in order to utilize the hydronic products. Uh, and we couldn't do too much with the facade, like I said, heritage building. Um, each floor of this building was also built for particular applications and uh, different occupancy types. So throughout the building, different types of products were used uh, to retrofit based on the type of usage that it would be uh, found in the space. We had conference rooms, um, open reception areas, uh, workshops, uh, wet labs, dry labs, uh, so just different types of different types of spaces altogether. A few of the things that the engineer looked at uh, in retrofitting this building, uh, of course, I mentioned earlier, was uh, upgrading the windows, uh, the building envelope, uh, sealing it uh, to control the infiltration within the space, and, and being able to utilize these different hydraulic type of products. Uh, because each floor was also very different from the next, uh, mixing stations were placed on each floor uh, to provide the w chilled water or heating water that was required for the space. Uh, on the sixth floor, uh, natural ventilation was utilized on that space as well, uh, another type of sustainable product, uh, to help increase the amount of energy efficiency and also to, to take a closer look at that type of product uh, for uh, building studies. A lot of the products that were utilized on the space or in, in this building uh, were designed to fit within the structural elements or, or the limitations of the, of the floor. I'm going to go through a couple examples so, so you can kind of see uh, the different products that were utilized. Um, like I said earlier, the facade can't really do too much to it. Uh, so when they upgraded the facade, they put a new window up, a very large window in fact. Uh, they looked at and what they could do to service this, this window, because uh, you couldn't really place anything uh, within viewing distance of the window and have it wash down the window and, and take care of the space there. So when we were talking with the engineer and the architect, uh, we looked at utilizing a high capacity convection unit that actually mounted onto the, the mullion of the windows, uh, as you can see from this image here that is blown up. Uh, the, the unit itself was designed to fit within the spacing of the window mullion, uh, as well as it was finished to match the color of the window mullion. And the discharge of it went left and right to cover the, the face of the window. As a secondary heating cooling uh, component, chilled sails were added to, uh, to the space as well, but placed uh, within reasonable viewing uh, distance away from the street level. Uh, 
Uh, one of the conference rooms in the building itself also had uh, significant restrictions with it, within it. Um, it was filled out with a lot of AV equipment, or the intention is to be filled out with a lot of AV equipment. Uh, also, it was a very noise critical space, uh, and so we couldn't put a lot of the uh, you know, typical linear beams up in the ceiling. So this is when we looked at utilizing the floor mounted displacement unit uh, with uh, active beam hybrid solution into the um, perimeter there uh, that you can see. So this utilized uh, the, the displacement, uh, the stratification to help uh, with the reduced load in the space. So we're only going to take a look at um, locating these beams at low level, bringing it, in, bringing it in at low velocity and conditioning just the occupied zone, whereas all the loads that are pushed up above the occupied zone were going to be exhausted back to the um, uh, air handling unit to be recovered. So a lot of uh, potential for savings there. Another space we have is the open lab space, a uh, very open area. Uh, this area we utilized uh, active beams with VAV inlets and also the, the wings. Uh, the wings acted more as a as, as the Quanda effect, but also as a aesthetic aesthetic um, component to the space itself as well. Um, to maximize the the space. Uh, of this particular floor, uh, because it, you know it's an old building, the floor floor to floor heights are, are very limited. Um, these beams are placed between the wood beam slats, and uh, and pretty much kind of hidden up to maximize the usage in the space as well. Uh, gave it a, an exposed insulation. Uh, some of these beams here also have the integrated return section, uh, so this of course helped reduce the amount of equipment going up into the space, um, and just kept the continuous look of the beam throughout. So in this beam, I, I, I touched on a couple of the products. Uh, like I said, mostly hydronics. Uh, there's also high performance fan coil units. There's displacement ventilation, your, your standard uh, displacement. Um, you have, we had some VAV terminal units. In the wet lab, we had uh, venturi valves as well as terminal uh, units. Um, there's uh, chilled sails, as you can see, uh, radiant panels, uh, a plethora of different types of products put out throughout this building here. Uh, one of our one of the things that we're we're doing with Fraunhofer in our partnership with them is, uh, like I said earlier, a research of uh, performance of the building system. So we're we're doing a comparison of what all these types of systems uh, do to the occupants in the space, um, taking polling um, surveys from them to find out you know comfort levels. Also to help develop uh, control sequences and strategies uh, of the different systems together. Um, in some areas, we also have two types of systems. Like I mentioned on the sixth floor, there's natural ventilation. The other system that's on the sixth floor is a mechanical system. Uh, so on that floor, uh, a lot of the research there that we're looking at is a comparison of uh, utilizing natural ventilation in areas that have um, uh, humid uh, climate as well. You know, instead of just typically using it along the west coast along the Pacific where, where the mild climates are, are more um, suited for natural ventilation, you know, how many usable hours can we actually use natural ventilation within a humid climate? Uh, and then in other areas, a, a comparison of energy consumption between a, a beam system or a fan coil system. So in summary, we've uh, seen a lot of good things. Uh, the, the market for retrofits, is, is there's great potential in it for doing energy savings. Um, as Jerry mentioned, uh, 75 to 80 percent of the buildings in 2030 um, are projected to, to have exist, or exist today, um, will exist in, in 2030. So there's great potential for, for that. Uh, a lot of retrofitting, a lot of energy savings, a lot of initiatives that, that will move, move it towards that type of uh, design. Um, beams are a unique solution for the retrofit applications uh, due, to, due to its a smaller profile size uh, and efficient operation. Um, there's a various types of products that can be utilized. You saw the ones that can be installed on the, on the floor, ones that can be used to replace uh, older induction legacy units, um, ceiling mounted types, uh, and it, of course it, can, it doesn't have to be just beams. Uh, we saw there were uh, chilled sails and radiant panels. Those, those are great products to utilize in, in applications where you might need just a small sensible load. Uh, these are very small uh, 
small profile type of uh, products that, that can just be added easily into the space if you have the hydronic system existing. Um, and then also feel free to contact Price or your local representative. Uh, we'll help you evaluate the suitability of utilizing active beams or, or any other sustainable products or fan powered products uh, on these retrofit projects. Uh, there's our email there, beamteam at price-hvac.com, uh, and we'll, we'll be sure to help you out and, and let you know what products would be uh, work well for your, your projects. All right, thank you, Chris. We're going to now open up the floor to questions. The first question we have is, is there a fan in the socket model beam? Driving the uh, the soffit beam is the primary error, and there is no fan directly located inside the beam itself. It's often serviced by either a central fan system through ductwork or perhaps a, uh, a fan power device with some sort of fan coil or something in local proximity. But uh, there is no no moving parts per se inside of the soffit beam. All right, thank you, Jerry. The next question. We mostly heard about cooling and how air moves in cooling mode. Would you please, would you please explain about air profile and air pattern for beams in heating mode? Okay, just like in any um, distribution system, you're, you're correct. You have hot and cold air flows, and cold air flows tend to throw less distance along the ceiling um, due to their density to come off the ceiling earlier, and warmer flows tend to stick to the ceiling or rise up inside the space. So the trick is, uh, will the temperature difference between the hot and the cold be such that we have a significant change in the throw characteristics of hot air versus cold air? And since most design guides prefer that you don't go more than 15 degrees above the, the room set point for heating mode, we try to adhere to that and as a result do not have appreciable differences. You might see a 10 to 15 percent gain in throw distance with the hot air versus the cold, but it's not, uh, it should not cause you significant issue. All right, thank you, Jerry. Another question. Has there been any work done with using DX cooling in conjunction with chilled beams? That question has come up numerous times in the last 12 years, and the short answer is no. Um, this is for several reasons, but uh, primarily the DX coils operate at a lower temperature and then do water coils, and uh, it, you know, unless you're doing temperature control at the coil surface, you have a tendency to freeze the coil, possibly due to the lower volumes and, and velocities that are across it. Now, that doesn't mean that there haven't been people that worked on it, but uh, I have no direct involvement with that. Do you, Chris? Yeah, I do not. Um, the only cup combination that I may see is, is an air handler with the DX. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's but an that's, excellent comment. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's an excellent comment. All right, next question. What is the supply air temperature for a beam retrofit entering water and cooling and heating? The, the question again is, what is the supply air temperature for a beam retrofit entering water and cooling and heating? Um, so the, the entering air will, will typically be based on uh, on the retrofit itself. So, so that will guide usually what is available. Uh, if we're using what's existing, um, temperatures typically are, are around 52 to 55 degrees supply air that go to the beam. Um, that's what we're what we want going to the air. And then on the entering water side, on the cooling side for beams, we want to keep that above the dew point, usually two to three degrees above. All right, thank you, Chris. We have time for a couple more questions. The next question is, what are the pros or cons um, in the VRF system versus the chilled beam system? Um, that also comes up fairly often, uh, and, and usually I answer with uh, several actually questions in a way. But um, the first is, what's your fear of risk? And if you look at uh, refrigerant systems, uh, although they are compact, uh, they are a flammable material, typically the refrigerant itself. And if you have a leak, you may have a challenge finding said leak. Now, for better or worse, if you have a water leak, usually you can find the water leak because it's visible. Now, in terms of infrastructure cost, I, I don't know how to answer that. My, my guess is that we're not that different in terms of the copper and or the quantity of copper required inside the system. But 
you know, the real difference is to me what level of risk you want to assume and what type. All right. Thank you, Jerry. For common plenum, how does the air get from one beam to the next? Well, you want this one, Chris? Sure. Uh, as we saw from the, the case study there, um, the, 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 the beams are sized, or the plenums on each beam will be sized for the appropriate volume of air that will be going to, to each beam. Uh, the connection point is a pretty much a transition that would be field mounted uh, as, as it goes from one beam to the next with the air inlet on the, on the um, supply side of the, of the first beam. All right, thank you, Chris. We have time for one last question, and it is what age of buildings are we typically seeing um, beam retrofits in? You know, that's, that's a, a broad topic in many ways because I, I know of a building in D.C. that they renovated and then two years later went in and re-renovated, okay? So it's all over the map, but if you look at the historical database, and, and Chris, maybe you would agree or disagree with this, but um, they're probably 20 to 30 years old would be in the range that you see most commonly. I would agree. And, and to your point, too, um, depending on the, the type of application, you never know what the building is being used for. Um, two or three years or even 10 years after the, the, the function of the space may change, too, and require a, a renovation. Which I should have mentioned that building in D.C. was that exact. They retasked the building, and the current system wasn't appropriate. Mm -hmm. Go figure. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Jerry, for your presentation, and thank you, Chris. Um, thank you all for joining us today. Shortly, you will receive an email with the PDH quiz, and you can expect to have your certificate mailed to you in about two to three weeks. And that will conclude our presentation for the day.